Well, this is the first time for quite a long time I've actually been able to stand here and look at somebody in the sanctuary. So it's quite a change and it's, it's, I have to tell you, it's rather nice. To those who are at home, we want to welcome them. And wherever they are worshipping with us from, we are delighted that we're gathering both here and in other places together. Some of us who are worshipping with us will be live. And if you are on Facebook just now, then we greet you in the name of the Lord. And if you're watching later on YouTube or on the telephone listening, then you also we welcome in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Those of us who are here, it's good to be here for the first time in how many months? I'm not sure. And uh, you have registered with Eventbrite to come here. We want to keep that going for the next few weeks anyway, through September. If you have never had an email with a link to that, and that won't so much be those who are with us, but perhaps those of you who are watching from home, if you haven't had a link telling you how you can register, then please get in touch with me or the office, and we will help you become part of our worshiping Sunday here in the sanctuary over September. We're going to pilot September, see how many want to worship with us. We're restricted to 50, but we would love as many of us to come and gather through these weeks as possible. So get in touch with us if you're not sure how to do this or you haven't had a link. For the next couple of weeks, his kids also will not resume nor prime time on Sunday mornings until we have again worked through our numbers and also uh, waited till the government gives us permission to have our kids, kids in a somewhat freer manner than is possible just now. When we're here in worship, we're aiming to wear masks. There are some of us who are, for whom that's not possible. You can still come into worship if that's not possible, but it would be good if those of us who come and gather here are able to wear masks and we'll try and do that all through worship, uh, and even until you get to your car outside in the car park. You'll notice that there are yellow markers all around the place that's trying to help us stay two meters apart, and they're also trying to help us move in a way that minimizes crossing over with one another. And if you could try and follow that uh, pattern, then that would be great. Uh, last week, we had some success with our trial run. <laughs> Uh, and therefore today, looking out at you, I think, I think you'll do a lot better than last week's guys. I just have that feeling. Um, I got a call this morning or a text this morning saying that a family who were going to be with us, somebody was coughing in the family, and though they think it's a cold, they stayed away. That's the right decision. Uh, we would love to have as many of us here as possible, but if there is something that you're just a wee bit concerned about, be safe stay away. We completely respect that. In fact, we would advise that. Some of us who are worshiping from home today are not able to be with us for various reasons, and we completely respect that. It's great for us to be here, but if you're worshiping from home, we want to support you in that decision, and we want to encourage you to do what is right for you and also for those of us who will be gathering with you. So please, we're welcoming you even though you're at home, and we're encouraging you to make the right decision for you and your family and for us as you do that week on week. Now, when you came in, you came in through the middle door, but when you leave, it's going to be slightly different. One of our door team is going to usher this side out first from the back, and you'll leave by that door over there. And then once you've left by that door and the door team have got this side safely out, this side will be invited to leave row by row as well, but just back through the normal door that you came in, and that will become clear at the end of the service. The toilet upstairs is closed off. If you do have need to go to the toilet during the service or to leave for any reason during the service, you can leave basically just as you would through a normal aisle, but just do so carefully and not speedily, but just not lingering next to somebody as you do so. At the end of the service, if there's something you think should happen that would make what we're doing here better, safer, and more worshipful, then have a word with Jack Cunningham or with myself or someone in the office. Uh, Jack Cunningham has been the chair of our team that's got us back in here safely. He has, and the team have announced that at 11.45 today, having got us back together in worship, they are now disbanded. 
So make sure you get hold of Jack before 11.45 to pass on your comments that he will then pass on to us. But if you don't get Jack or someone in the team, speak to me, speak to the office, and we'll see if we can improve what we're doing here Sunday by Sunday. A huge thanks to Jack, to the whole team. A huge thanks also to the audiovisual chaps who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes so that we can be heard here, but also so that we can still streamline uh, simultaneously. Huge thanks. I notice it's a wee bit fresh in here today. Uh, it's August in Scotland. We'll, we'll probably work on what we're doing with heating over the coming weeks as well, but that, that's something I'm noticing myself here. During worship, we're going to have hymns like you've been seeing over the last number of weeks at home. And we're going to hopefully, in inverted commas, sing here, but not audibly, because one of the things the government is not permitting us to do is to sing in worship. But I'm going to actually ask you to stand if you're able and uh, sing in your head, hum, mouth the words. But one of the concerns from the health advisors is that we don't spray out potential risk, and therefore we're not going to sing out loud. But I do want you to stand. I do want you to still praise God as we sing, and you'll be singing, albeit through your head, humming, or with your silent words. The Lord will hear, even though we might not hear one another. Let me say to those who are worshipping at home, I found it quite challenging when I was on holiday to watch a TV screen and to worship in the same way that we might with one another. And uh, last Sunday, for example, I found myself standing to sing at home, and I found that much more conducive. Though it might look a little bit strange to summon your family, let me encourage you to do the same. And while we're not singing out loud here, you can still belt out your praise to God at home. Before I call us to worship this morning, I want to say two last things. First of all, another huge thanks. Winnie McVicker has now stepped back from being an elder on the Kirk Session. Winnie has been an elder uh, for over 30 years. I think it's 32 years. She's now retiring from the Kirk Session, and we want to note publicly our indebtedness to Winnie for her service, not only over these years, but for the really gracious and lovely and prayerful way she conducted herself through that in the Kirk Session and with you in your districts. A huge thanks to Winnie. Second thing I want to note is that on the 13th of September, that's uh, two weeks' time, we're going to have a special service in here, a service where we'll have some professed faith and also a baptism. And I want to say to us, but perhaps more importantly to those at home, uh, if there's anyone who thinks it's right and timely to profess publicly their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, their Lord and Savior, and maybe even be baptized for the first time, then get in touch with me and I will help you become part of that service. That's for the 13th of September. And if you would like to do that, but for some reason the 13th of September is not appropriate, let me know and we'll see how we can accommodate you at another time. All of that said, we're going to worship God. Let me read to you these words from Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, you servants of the Lord, you who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to His name, for that is pleasant. And so we're going to stand together and we're going to sing to his praise. How lovely is your dwelling place. Let's stand and sing.
We're going to pray together. Let us bow and pray as we bring our praise, our adoration, and also our confession to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we want to join the psalmist in praising your name, and we consider ourselves servants of you, the living God, but also children of a wonderful Heavenly Father, saved by your mercy and your grace through Jesus Christ. And so we worship you this day as Creator and our Redeemer in Jesus. And we worship you, Lord, because you're in heaven. We don't see you, but we know that you're not bound by the things of earth. You are spirit, we're told, and you're not bound to one location. You are in incredible awe ways in all places at all times. You know all things. There is not a moment that is not before your eyes, the beginning and the end, and you have power that we cannot comprehend. You have created all this world and we ourselves within this world. And we marvel not only at what we see, what we experience, what we touch, but that we ourselves are so wonderfully and intricately made. The splendor and wonder of your creation leaves us in awe. And we bow in the mystery that you have re chosen to reveal yourself to us intimately as one true living God, yet in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And though you take us beyond the limits of our understanding, you have delighted to make yourself known to us. And Lord, we pray that as we get to know you better and better through life, so we might also marvel that you know us intimately. And so as we come here to worship, Lord, this day, whether in our places at home or whether here in Maxwell Mearns Castle Church buildings, we come and pray that you would speak to each one of us as you know us, as we need to hear from you and draw from us and from our own hearts a great love and, and praise and adoration to you, our God. Equip us, Lord, increasingly to worship you faithfully. And Father, forgive us our sins. We know that every single one of us, every man, boy, woman, child has sinned and falls short of your glory. And yet we know also that Jesus has come into this world for us, that he has come to this world and lived sinlessly as we do not that he went to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, where we need our sins to be taken from us and your judgment also. And he would do this for us. And so this day, Lord, we come mindful of what it cost you for our forgiveness, for our part in your family. And so, Lord, as we seek your forgiveness, even for that which we have committed this week, we pray, Father, that we might be by your Spirit increasingly renewed, that we might increasingly put away, kill off that which is sin in our lives and increasingly become like our Savior Jesus. We know, Lord, that will not be a task finished until glory, but we pray that every day you would minister into our lives by the power of your Spirit, that we might be the people you want us to be, that we might be equipped to serve you in the way you want us to serve you, and that in all of this we might rightly be your wonderful church. Lord, grow as we pray, both in number, but also in our walk with you in a way that's pleasing to you. And Lord, as we come back together again, we, we want not necessarily with one another here to hear our voices because of the constraints within which we worship. But together, Lord, we pray the same prayer. We're here, we're at home, but together we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand again and worship as we praise God with our next hymn.
uh, have been blessed over these number of weeks because as we've been singing our songs, all the songs that we've been singing, all the praise items have actually been recorded here in our own worship time. And that's been a super experience for us, I think, as a congregation to continue with the continuity of hearing those that we know lead us in our praise. I noticed that in that song there we sang, I could hear Callum's voice, he's with us today, not singing quite so loudly, and Debbie's voice, at least she's here not singing. And they're appreciating, I think, the break uh, from having to come up front and, and rehearse, but, but we are looking forward to them coming back and leading us from the front with the musicians as well at some point in the future. One of the things we've also enjoyed is Pauline leading us in our children's talks, and Pauline's going to lead us again today from our kitchen table as she talks especially to the children, and we get to share in that here as well. Good morning. Have you ever had to wait a really, really long time for something you were looking forward to? Maybe a birthday, an amazing holiday, or a new film coming out? It can be really hard to wait for something special. Sometimes it's even hard to wait for your dinner that night. But today we are going to be finding out about some people in the Bible who waited a very long time for something. Their names at the beginning of their part of God's story were Abraham and Sarai. And then God changed their names to Abraham and Sarai. We find their story in the very first book of the Bible, in the book called Genesis. And it starts at chapter 12, just a couple of chapters after the story of Noah. So we're before the time of Moses and God's people, the Israelites. Between now and Christmas, I know I mentioned the C word in August. We're going to be looking at the people of the Bible in the Old Testament to help us understand how God's special family and the books in the Bible start to fit together and make up the whole picture of the Bible. So today we're going to be watching a video of a story of people who waited a long time. But before that, do any of you know what Old Faithful is? Well, it's a geezer which is basically a hole in the ground which sprays up water. And Old Faithful does this every 90 minutes, every single day. And it's done that for as long as people have known it's existed. Have a watch at it in action. The reason it's called Old Faithful is because it sprays water every single day, without fail. They can count on it going to happen. And we're going to find out how God was faithful to Abraham and Sarah. God's story, God's promise to Abraham. So part of God's story is about a promise God made to Abraham, and it begins like this. Once there was a guy named Abraham. He had a wife, Sarah. They didn't think they could have any kids, which was a major disappointment because they really wanted a family. But little did Abraham know that God had a very special plan for him. When Abraham was 75 years old, God promised to give him kids, and one day God would send the rescuer through his family. All God asked was that Abraham and Sarah leave their home first and follow him. Now, they had a tough choice to make, leave all their friends and trust God, or stay comfortable. This was not easy. See, Abraham really wanted kids, but was already pretty old. Sarah was getting up there too, not to mention she had never been able to get pregnant. So if Abraham and Sarah were going to leave their home and trust in God's promise, they had to believe that God would do something that seemed impossible. The good news is, they decided to trust that God would keep his promise. That's always the right choice. So Abraham and Sarah moved from their home to a land called Canaan. Right away, God reminded Abraham of his promise. He said, I will make your children like the dust of the earth. Can specks of dust be counted? If they can, then your children can be counted. This was God's funny way of telling Abraham he would have a lot of kids because nobody can count every piece of dust. Well, this promise seemed great, but after a while, 
Abraham and Sarah still had no kids, let alone as many as the pieces of dust. Now, they were really old. Sometimes God doesn't remind us of his promises because he wants us to learn to trust him. But God took Abraham outside at night and told him to look at the stars. He reminded Abraham that he would give him that many kids. So Abraham decided to keep believing God. He and Sarah waited again. After more years, he got impatient. This time, God told Abraham, by next year, Sarah will have a son. But by now, Abraham was 99 years old. He and Sarah had both given up on having kids and God's promise. In fact, when Abraham told Sarah what God said, she laughed. It's probably not a good idea to laugh at God's promises, but Sarah was tired of waiting and had stopped trusting. The great thing is, even if we think it's impossible, God really does keep his promises. And just like God promised, Sarah got pregnant the next year after Abraham's 100th birthday. When her son was born, she named him Isaac, which means laughter. Sarah said, God has given laughter to me. Everybody who hears about this will laugh with me. And think about it, a really old lady having a baby is pretty funny. God kept his promise to give Abraham and Sarah a son. Even though they didn't think it was possible, it was easy for God because he can do anything, including giving old people babies. And remember how God was going to give Abraham as many children as the stars in the sky? Well, Isaac grew up and had children who had more children who had more children. This kept going and going and going. And guess who eventually was born in Abraham's line? The rescuer himself, God's son, Jesus. All because Abraham followed God and trusted God to keep his promise. And that's the story of God's promise to Abraham. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Abraham and Sarah were old. God promised to give Abraham kids. Abraham and Sarah waited. They got impatient. God reminded them he keeps his promises. Abraham and Sarah waited more. They got impatient again. God told them Sarah would have a baby. Sarah laughed. She had a baby. Jesus was eventually born into their family. God always keeps his promises. And that's a part of God's story. So, God promised Abraham and Sarah he would give them a family. But they had to wait for a very long time for that family to come. Sarah didn't even think she could have children. Abraham and Sarah found it hard to wait. They got impatient and tried to speed up God's promise. But God kept reminding them that he would keep his promise. He even changed Abram's name to Abraham as part of that promise. You might hear the word covenant being used in church or read it in your Bible. And covenant means promise. And this was God's covenant with Abraham that was happening. God will always keep his promises to us because he is faithful. The geezer, old faithful, always shoots out water every day and God will always keep his promises. He will always do what he says he's going to do, although we may have to wait a while sometimes. God will do things at the right time, in his time, not when we think it should happen. We need to trust him and have faith that he will keep his promises no matter what. Having faith is believing or trusting in something, even though we don't know exactly how it will turn out. Imagine you were about to go on a roller coaster. Would it take faith to trust that you would be safe even if you felt scared? Definitely. You would have to trust that whoever built the roller coaster built it right and that the safety harnesses would stay on tight. In a similar way, when we have faith in God, we trust him and we believe in him. And we trust his promises, even though we don't know exactly how that will turn out. And when we have to wait, we definitely need to have faith. God promised Abraham he would have a family, but not just any family. Abraham's son Isaac was the beginning of God's nation. God's special family, the Israelites, which became a huge nation. And Jesus was born into that family. You can trace his family tree all the way back to Abraham. And now we are part of that family too. When God kept his promise to Abraham and Sarah, he was carrying out his rescue plan to save all of us. God's special family also had to wait a very long time for their rescuer Jesus to come, but God kept his promise. He always has and he always will. Oh,
It's great to be able to join with each other as we pray. And uh, Sheila is going to lead us in our prayer. It's going to be a recorded prayer as we've been having over the last number of weeks. But we pray because we know that we have a God who cares for us and cares for his world and one who also delights in hearing our thanks when we have so many good things to thank him for. Let us bow in prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you this morning in thankfulness. Thank you, Father, that you are sovereign, God of the past, present and future, and eternal, same yesterday, today and tomorrow. We thank you for your greatness and your constant love and faithfulness. In a world where things are uncertain, changing and shifting, we thank you that your enduring love and faithfulness are the solid rock on which we can trust, assured that your providence and grace will prevail. We thank you, Father, that the whole universe belongs to you was created by you and that you are sovereign over everything and every situation and yet you love and care for each one of us. It is totally beyond our understanding but we thank you Father for your incredible unfailing love. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus into the world and that he died sacrificially on a cross for each of us. Thank you for his resurrection ascension and that he's at your right hand side interceding for us now. Thank you for the assurance that for those who put their trust in Jesus, their sins are forgiven and they have the promise of eternal life. Thank you for Jesus, our Saviour. We thank you for your living word and thank you that Scott preaches weekly the gospel to us. Be with him this morning as he opens your word. We thank you for Scott and Anita and we pray for your blessing on them just now. Father, we thank you for all those in our fellowship who work with children, families and young people. We pray in particular for Daniel, Pauline and Fiona as they try to negotiate regulations at this time and continue to bring your love and good news. We thank you, Father, for our church family, for those in the church building and those worshipping at home. We pray that we feel united in your presence. Thank you that we are able to open the building now and we thank you for all those enabling that to happen. We thank you for our families and friends. We pray for all those who know you that their faith may be strengthened and deepened. And for those who do not know the good news of your gospel, we pray that you will open their eyes, hearts and minds to your amazing grace. Thank you for the opportunities you give us to witness for you and give us the courage and wisdom to do so. We pray for our broken world where disease, social unrest, persecution and poverty are rife. And we ask that at home and abroad, you raise up Christian leaders that your wisdom prevails and that your will is done. We pray for all those in our church family who are in need of your arms of compassion, comfort and love around them, especially those who are unwell, having or awaiting treatment, who are anxious, depressed, lonely, confused, are caring for loved ones, are in nursing homes, are worried about employment or have lost their jobs. We pray for teachers and children at the start of a very different school term. Father, we ask that you support them all, Give them strength sufficient for their needs and a deep sense of your peace. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings you have poured into our lives, all the daily essentials and much more. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on him and we pray these prayers in his name. Amen. We're not handing out Bibles these days uh, because of our COVID restrictions, but we're going to read the Bible nevertheless. And if you have one with you, your own Bible, then uh, there's the time to open up Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and uh, we'll have it on the screen, I think, as well, but it would be good if you hold your own Bible, and we're running from verse 13. This is God's Word. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Amen. May God bless this reading from his word. Before we spend a moment thinking about this passage in Matthew's gospel, we're going to sing one more time, and we're going to sing about our reverence for God, and especially as he speaks to us through his word. Let's stand and sing. If you open your Bible back up to Matthew chapter 16, some of you who have been with us over a number of weeks realize that before I went on holiday, I spent three weeks in this particular passage. In fact, I'd intended to spend four, but for reasons of technical difficulty, we never got to have our fourth Sunday on it. But when I was thinking about what I might preach on today, it occurred to me that what I left unspoken prior to my holidays is so important from this passage that I really needed to come back and just finish off what we had started uh, a f- quite a number of weeks ago now, in fact. And so we're in Matthew chapter 16 and from verse 13 onwards. This is actually a pivotal passage in the book of Matthew as he tells the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's pivotal because we get to this point where Simon, one of the apostles, the penny drops as it were. He comes to a new clarity because God has opened his eyes to see that the one that he's been with, the one that he's been following, the one that he's been seeing, listening to, sleeping alongside in the rough, eating with, drinking with, getting tired with, the one that he has been spending so much time morning, noon, and night with is truly the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is who Jesus is. He is God incarnate, and He's come to do a job of being the anointed one to be the Savior of the world. And so, Matthew, as he tells the story of the gospel, as he focuses on this great confession, makes us realize that here is the point at which 
everything turns, and Jesus now starts purposely going up to Jerusalem in order to fulfill that work of being the Christ, the Savior, the chosen one, the king, the prophet, the priest, and he's going to the cross of Calvary. And as he's heading up there, before he goes, he says these most significant words to Matthew and to the apostles in what we've got as Matthew chapter 16, and he declares a name of what he's going to do. And the name of what he's going to do and the people that he's going to do it for, he gives a name, and that name is the church. The church. It's quite staggering. So, in verse 16, as Peter says, Simon says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says to him, well, you know what, Simon? This was not de- worked out by human thought. This was declared to you by God. This was revealed to you by heaven. I am going to build my church on this rock, you, Peter, with this confession of faith. And the church that he talks about, as we would call it in English, is a word in Greek, which we said before, is made up of two bits, out and to call. And so the way he's going to build his church is to call people to himself to be a people of worship, to be a people of witness for sure, to be a people of service, people who will love God and love their neighbor as themselves. When Pauline was speaking earlier, she spoke about Abraham. Abraham became foundational, as it were, to the church. God called him out, and he responded in faith, and he went where God wanted him to go in faith. Abraham has been declared to be the father of faith, the ones who declare with Simon Peter, the one who declare with Abraham, the ones who declare through the centuries that God is a God to be trusted. He's faithful. And in this regard, he sent his son Jesus to be the Christ, to be the Messiah. And so, we have this great declaration followed by a great promise of Jesus Christ, I will build my church. Now, the thing that I want to come back to today in which we've in only a part of the way talked about before is the latter part, and the gates of Hades will not overcome or not prevail against it. And when we were thinking about this, we were thinking about Hades previously in a previous week in the context of suffering, and that's very legitimate because Jesus goes on in a moment or two to speak about uh, them carrying their own cross in verse 21 and onwards. But right at the heart of this message about that even includes this word Hades and what sounds like a bit of a battle that Hades will not overcome the church is a great message for us who are part of the church. This morning, we are delighted that we're joined by, I don't know how many people live on their tablets or TV or laptop. We will be joined later at some time, people watching the recording on Facebook or YouTube, And we are also meeting with them here. My heart glows when I think of us worshiping together wherever we're worshiping from. But I have to say, standing here is especially important and significant and special for me. And looking out on you is so thrilling. It's so thrilling because I do consider you friends. I do consider you close to me, and I hope me close to you. And that's great that we're together once again, but so thrilling because I'm looking out on what Christ has promised to do. You are his church. You are what he has promised to Simon Peter. A bit of it, no no doubt. And, And the astonishing thing is, which makes me so thrilled to look out and see you, is that I'm looking out upon Christ's church, who he loves. You know, the the whole background to Jesus coming into this world and doing what he did and dying the way he died in order to bring together a people who are reconciled to God that he calls his church, is his love. It's, It's a staggering thought. And of all the images that Jesus uses for his church, one of the most striking ones is, that the church is the bride of Christ. Now, as some of you know, we've recently been through weddings and stuff like that, and I can tell you, 
husbands love their wives, not least when they're standing holding their hands and saying, I do. And in that day when uh, we recently w witnessed a couple happy, smiling, rejoicing, taking each other by the hands, looking into each other's eyes, radiating affection and fondness for one another, they promised and covenanted to one another to love each other, to be loyal, to be faithful, and so on, until separated by death. The, the, the reason that we make these vows is because there are, in a shadowy way, a mirror or a picture, in a very small shadowy way, of what God has committed for His people because He loves them. That as that bride and groom held their hands, so He will never let go of our hands because He loves us. And so Christ, Christ came into this world and is building a church that He loves. And he's building it, as we've said previously, by salvation, and he's building it by sanctification. And a lot of the sanctification that we are built as church in is not only because we ourselves struggle with our internal sin, though that is true. We are saints called apart to be for Jesus, but still sinners. But actually because of the onslaught of the world around us. That which in a previous Sunday I said smells like Hades. Of all the things that we might say about this word Hades from this passage in Matthew chapter 16, as Jesus speaks about the church he's going to build, he says, I'm going to build my church. And he says, and the gates of Hades, verse 18, will not overcome it. Of all that we might say about Hades, I think quite simply we would want to say, in, in the mind of Jesus here, he's thinking about that which smells of the devil, that which smells of destruction, that which smells of death. And in a previous week when we talked about how that might be an assault on the church and therefore a painful thing to go through, I didn't actually quote you at the time, but let me do it today. And that is that when Bryson Arthur wrote his book recently on suffering, he wrote a particular uh, passage about suffering and persecution, which is related to suffering for the church. And he said this, he said, it's the goal, it's goal that is suffering in terms of persecution. Its goal is destruction of human identity, even to the point of death. It's an antithesis, the opposite of the gospel of acceptance and eternal life. This is what, when suffering comes on the church for being church, this is what it's about. It's about the opposite of the gospel. It's trying to create destruction, death, not life, not good things. But what I wanted to come back to today was true as that is, and no doubt related to what Jesus then extends in his conversation with the disciples about from verse 21 onwards, is not actually the key thing that he's saying here, I believe, when he says he'll build his church. No, rather, when he says he'll build his church, he's speaking about Hades in the context of not being able to stand against the advance of the church. It's not so much that Hades is assaulting, but rather the church is advancing, and the gates of Hades will not be able to withstand that. When you think about gates, especially in Jesus' time, there were cities, and they put walls around them, and they created gates. And the gates, of course, were so often to keep enemies out. And if you think about gates in Jesus' time, they're certainly like our time. There are prisons where there are big walls, and there are gates, and that's to keep prisoners in. With Jesus coming into this world, the gates of Hades cannot stand against the advance of what Jesus has purposed in his saving grace, in the gospel, in building the church. If we are enemies, as it were, to Hades, because we follow Jesus as his church, as his message of the gospel goes out, the gates of Hades cannot stop that advance. If you think about it in terms of a prison, if, if, if the, the aim of the devil is to try and contain people and to keep them trapped in ways and patterns of life, which, though he welcomes people with a smile, always becomes devilish and destructive and deathly, 
with the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ as he builds his church, he breaks these gates and prisoners escape. There is no way to contain those who hear the call of Jesus Christ and respond to it. The gates will not stop the building of Christ's church. There's a couple of pictures in the Old Testament, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, I want to draw attention to, and they're quite interesting. One of them, we have seen those of us who've been studying Samson. A number of us were studying the book of Samson recently, and we came to a very interesting picture where Samson himself goes down wayward Samson, though he was. He goes to a particular place. He is going to be set upon by the Philistines, and as he is in their grasp, as it were, it's nighttime. The gates are shut. He's trapped. They're going to wait to get him because he can't get out. And then there's this picture, story of how Samson comes with all his strength, takes the gates, marches them back into the context of his own people of Israel, deposits them, and goes on his way. It's a striking picture of how Jesus actually comes into our world, and even though Hades, the devilishness of this world, thinks that the church can be trapped and curtailed and put to death as they were hoping to do Samson, Jesus comes in and just breaks forward these gates, takes them back to where he wants them to be, and tosses them aside. They can't stop Christ's purposes being fulfilled in the building of his church. That's Samson, uh, that's Judges chapter 16. There's another picture that you find at the heart of this passage in Matthew 16. It's an engagement between Jesus and Simon Peter, the apostle. And when Simon Peter goes then on to preach the gospel, he filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to stand up and talk about Jesus. And the gates of Hades, if I can put it that way, say, stop talking about him. And uh, Peter won't stop. And in one particular encounter, immediately after Peter begins to preach about Jesus, who he's met, seen, risen from the dead, who has saved him, called him, made him part of his church, in one particular place, in chapter 12, he's put in prison. And, and Peter's jailed. He's suffering for talking about Jesus. And locked into that jail, suddenly, by God's purposes, an angel comes and it says he opens the gate. And Peter is brought out. There, there is a picture of what Jesus is doing in his church when he chooses to build it, a, a metaphor as it were, that flows out of that real situation that Peter found himself in. As we read Matthew 16, the gates of Hades cannot overcome. They will not prevail against Christ's church. And it says in chapter 12, verse 10, that Peter passes the guards, came to the iron gate leading to the city, and it opened there by itself. God was building his church through Peter, and even the gates of Hades could not stop that happening. There's no gate that can keep captive those who Jesus calls to himself. And today, I have a very short, simple message. And I've got two, in a sense, two quick applications just to bring this to head. And the first is this. I suspect those of us, most of us here, know that Jesus Christ calls us to himself. Can I say to you that if you are hearing Jesus Christ call you to himself, he's reminding you from Matthew chapter 16 that the one that he's calling you to is not just some guy who lived in history. He's not just some guy who's a religious teacher, some kind of guru. He's not just some person who's a prophet or wise or spiritual. He is the Christ the one sent by God. He is the Son of the living God. He is God incarnate. He is the one who is our Savior, and He calls us to Himself. And if you hear Him calling, maybe not literally in your ears, but if you find yourself seeing Him and hearing Him and hearing about Him in a new way that He is calling you to give your life to Him, 
then do that because He loves you, and He wants you to be part of His church. And He is building His church, and He will continue to build His church. And if you're hearing Him calling you, then respond. Abraham responded, as Pauline was telling us. All through history, men and women have been responding to Him in the building of His church. And the power of His call is so real, so powerful for us and for our lives, that if you remember, there was a man who died in the, new, in the, in, in, in the gospel story. And, and in that gospel story of John's gospel, as John tells the story of the man who died, he was laid out in his tomb, a big boulder in front of it and so on, dead. In fact, dead for days. And the, the reason Jesus let him lie there, as it were, for days is to say, he's really dead. He's as dead as you can be. His name was Lazarus. And Jesus went to that tomb and said to him, Lazarus, come out. Now, there was no chance Lazarus could come out on his own because he was dead. We are dead spiritually. We can't come out without his call because we are dead, as Paul puts it, in our transgressions and sins. But the call of Jesus Christ is so powerful that Lazarus was brought to life by the power of the calling of Jesus. Are you hearing him call you? Because if you are, there's a power in that call that will bring you to life and life eternal. And Lazarus came out and he wants us to respond to that call and come out to him from whatever our beliefs are just now, or lack of, whatever our geographical location, wherever we are economically or socially or educationally, whatever age we are, whether we're younger or middle-aged or very mature, whatever stage, if you hear the call of Jesus Christ saying to you, as Peter declared, I am the Christ, I am the Son of the living God, He's calling to be part of His church, and that means life life eternal. But the second thing I want to say is to those of us who are already part of that church, as we live out our life as part of that church, we do so by the grace of Jesus. In a few weeks' time, we're hoping to have a service of profession of faith and baptism. When anyone stands at the front of any church building and professes that faith amongst the amongst the church, amongst the people of God, they do so only on the basis of grace, God's gift of life. But the wonderful thing about a gift, and especially that which God gives to us, is He doesn't take it back. It's given. It's a life to be lived and even for eternity. And when those folks come to the front and acknowledge Jesus Christ as their own Lord and Savior, as we have many of us here today, what they will be recognizing is that it's not because they're really strong in their faith. It's not because they really know everything there is to know about God or about Jesus Christ or Hades or what might happen in terms of suffering. It's not because they've mastered everything and anything about the Christian faith. When those who come to our church and profess their faith is because they've seen their dependence and their need of a Savior who is Jesus Christ. And if they come shaking because they know that their faith is weak, maybe even better. Because the one thing that the Lord is going to do is He's going to build His church. And that means not only numerically, but it means in the walk that we have with the Lord. He's going to build it in regard to our salvation, but also our sanctification. He's going to help us and that which he starts, he always completes. And so, I suspect when we have some folks here, whatever age or stage of life that they are coming to us from, they will come with all sorts of questions and confusions and limitations and weaknesses and fears. But if they are hearing that great call of Jesus Christ to know him as their Lord, their Savior, then He will hold them as part of His church through whatever they're going to meet. And one day, even death. 
And that's the great enemy the gates of Hades will not stand amongst because Jesus just steamrollered over that gate on the third day when he was raised to life. For those of us who are part of his church, we are a people who are blessed by his grace, blessed by his love. Whatever we're going through, whatever rocky road we're finding these days of COVID and distancing and isolation and shielding and, and all the things that go with it, our employment concerns, our financial concerns, our relational concerns, even bereavement or even suffering through sickness, whatever we're going through, we, as part of his church, are a loved church by Christ himself. And we need to pray for one another and each other that we will love actually one another as Christ has loved us. And as Christ has served us by giving up his life for us, so we want to pray that Christ would let us and help us serve one another by giving even of ourselves to one another and even to his world. He has you. If you're part of his church, you're a living stone being built up into that great people that Christ wants you to be. Simon Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. We're going to sing because he's the king of kings, but as we go to sing and as the chaps prepare the music for us, let's bow our heads and ask, is the Lord calling us for the first time? Respond in faith, putting aside the past, moving on with him for the future. Is he calling us again as part of his church to be reminded of what he has done for us, who he is to us, Take a moment to rejoice and acknowledge him as your King of kings, Lord of lords, and that whatever is coming your way, he is more than able, more than powerful to take you through, even one day, death to resurrection, life. As they prepare the song, let us take a moment to pray.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship, life-giving power of God the Holy Spirit be yours this day and always. Amen. Sleep